competing in. We are repeating in. We are believing in. It's time for us to shift our mind from best in the world to best for the world. Make decisions intentional. To take decisions intentional. Making decisions intentional. Making decisions intentional To take decisions intentional Making decisions intentional It creates a new world to mind a shift Intentionality Perceptuality Conceptuality We are choosing to shift our mind To best for the world Best for our world Make decisions intentional Take decisions intentional, making decisions intentional. Make decisions intentional, to take decisions intentional, making decisions intentional. By eating things, we we really we eat the landscape. It sort of it enters our our mouth mm -hmm. and our bodies. So we embody our relationship to nature through food. Hello good people and welcome to the second season of Sustain Me podcast where we try to understand what sustainability really means and how we can move towards it in our daily lives. Hello good people and welcome back to Sustain Me. Uh, today we have a guest, his name is Frederick. He's one of our teachers at Mambo University. Here we're in our program of leadership for sustainability. So before we get started with, you know, his personal life story and what the podcast is going to be about, I wanted to ask how everyone is doing today. So we can start with a guest. How are you today, Frederick? I'm okay. I'm suffering a little bit from the regular cold flu that seems like most of people are having these days. But yeah. otherwise, I'm, I'm kind of fine. Excited to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Oh, Nat? Uh, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm excited. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking forward to um, this episode because uh, obviously, like Frederick is going to share a little bit with us, and uh, I'm I'm great. Um, just the weather in Malmo, it's <laughs> it's really it does have its ups and downs. So otherwise, I'm good. I'm good. Yep. And you, Paula? I okay. am I am great. It's, <laughs> I guess same as you. I also suffer from a little bit of a flu, and yeah, excited to be here and to learn how Frederick actually came to be our teacher. Yeah. which is going to be an exciting journey. So uh, with that being said, um, for the people that don't actually know you, uh, would you mind introducing yourself, a little bit of your, your background, life story? <laughs> uh, okay, so let's say that I'm, I work as a teacher at Malmö University. Mm -hmm. um, I teach in environmental science, but also on wider topics of, of sustainability, social innovation, social entrepreneurship, and so forth. And I've been doing this for... Um, almost 20 years now. Um, but before that, I used to work as a chef, actually. So okay. food is sort of one of my favorite topics and actually more or less what brought me into the field of, of sustainability, I would say. Um, apart from working at university, I'm also a very enthusiastic urban farmer. And uh, I'm also engaged in a number of initiatives. I'm on the board of a social enterprise called Yalla Trappan mm -hmm. here in Malmö. And um, yeah, that's more or less who I am, very briefly. Okay. The chef part got yeah. my attention. Oh, nice. <laughs> how long ago was this? No, actually, the first years when I worked here as a teacher, I was running also a catering service on the side. So, but more or less 15 to 20 years ago. Yeah. Okay. But you, you said that the, that the, the chef part brought you to sustainability. Yes. So where do you make that link? Well, um, so one of the first jobs that I had as a chef, um, I was uh, working in the, the hospital kitchen here in, in Malmö. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, this is um, around 1987 or something like that. And we were really doing stuff um, from the ground up. I mean, we were... We were when we were doing a mayonnaise. We were, you know, we were, we had the eggs and the mustard and the oil. You know, mm -hmm. we were really cooking everything from from basic ingredients. Okay. Um, and over time, I saw that change. So I started working as an assistant in the kitchen, um, 
by the, the time I, I left, I was actually head of, of the production in the kitchen. And, and then we were not doing anything from the basic um, foods anymore. We were opening cans with uh, processed foods. We were, you know, opening boxes with frozen fish, putting them into an oven or something like that. So this mm. transformation from really having the, 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 the fish, having the vegetables and so forth, over to processed, pre-cooked, frozen and so forth. And this was during kind of a very brief period of time. It's like eight years or something like that. Mm -hmm. A total transformation. And this made me reflect on sort of what it is doing to us. What is it doing to, to nature? What is, it, what is it doing to our relationship to, to nature? Because food is so fundamental for all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has a fundamental impact on, on the planet also, the way that we produce it. Uh, from ethical positions, from sustainability positions, and so forth, and by eating things, we we really we eat the landscape. It sort of it enters our our mouth mm -hmm. and our bodies. So we embody our relationship to nature through food. Wow. So what happens when we go from really growing the food, um, accessing the, the the raw materials, the, the, the meat, the fish, and then instead into something that comes in a box from a factory. What happens to us? What happens to nature? So that was kind of my reflection where I started um, my sort of quest for sustainability. It was really about asking these questions. Yeah. How can we reconnect with the ecosystems that we are actually embedded in? Yeah. I think that's something really important what you're saying because we kind of lose contact to what we're eating. It's just all ready and it's fast and it doesn't but it doesn't even taste good. So <laughs> it's it's just food became something to stay alive instead of like something that connects us to uh, nature or that connects us to our what we basically are like yeah. connected to everything and of course i mean previous generations they probably didn't think about it that way for them it was just a way to stay alive yeah. mm. probably but um as we have lost this link it's something that we see now is missing it's uh, kind of a missing um yeah. way of connecting to yeah. our ecosystems no, yeah, definitely. That reminds me of my mom and me. We went fishing a lot. So wow. when we <laughs> yeah, when we were eating fish, which is not that often, we really went out, fished the fish and then we killed it by ourselves, which is also a process of valuing the animal. If you need to kill it yourself, you have a total different value of the food you're eating. And yeah, then it was fresh in the evening, freshly grilled, and it was perfect. It was just the best fish you can imagine. And yeah, if you then compare it to the frozen fish you can get everywhere, it's no, it's not the same. <laughs> it's really no. not the same. Th that's uh, also something you did mention that you also um, do urban farming. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very interested in the, this <laughs> concept <laughs> of urban farming. So. Could you tell us a little bit more about the urban farming initiative that you have and what? what well, it's um, it's a very it, it's kind of a private thing, so it's not really an, an initiative in that sense. But um, I'm a historian; that's my sort of academic background, mm -hmm. uh, even before I, I became a chef. But um, we have had urban farming more or less as long as we've had cities. Mm -hmm. So people have always been growing food in the city. Um, but there was a change in about 100 years ago with the, with the industrialization of cities. So we had a lot of people moving into the cities from the countryside. We also had then a lot of, of, of new social tensions and, and social problems, poverty and so forth. And um, also ac actually lack of food. Um, mm. So people were really trying to grow food everywhere they could in the city. And poorer parts of the population were given small plots uh, to grow and so forth. And this started something called the um, allotment movement. Um, mm -hmm. It came largely from Germany, where it's called the Schrebergarten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, Malmö was one of the leading cities in Sweden, actually the first city in Sweden where we have organized uh, allotments. And that was in the 1880s. Um, so in, in its heyday in the 1920s, we had about 6,000 allotments in Malmö still. I think oh. we have something at around 5,000 or something in Malmö today. Okay. So there's quite a lot. 
Okay. That is a lot. Yes. What is this? Allotments, awesome. like where you get a, a piece and then you get to farm something on it yep. or something? Okay. So there are two types, basically. One type okay. is where you uh, would rent um, a piece of land from the municipality mm. and grow food for yourself, more or less. Okay. So about 100, 150 square meters, that's kind of the, I mean, the most common size, I think. There's also a possibility of having something that's a little bigger, mm. something like 300 square meters, where you also can have a small house where you can live mm. in the summer. So I have, um, uh, with my wife, we have uh, one of these plots with a house on and then two other plots to grow um, potatoes and onions and beans and cabbage and asparagus and nice. apples and figs and oh, okay. <laughs> tomatoes. <Just> and <laughs> everything that grows here, basically. Yes. Um, That's and there's, awesome. Yeah. So actually, I mean, part of the year, um, W most of the food is something that we grow ourselves. So we go into the garden and say, okay, what's ripe today? So this is what we're having for dinner. Oh, mm. wow, that, that just sounds so <laughs> amazing. It's like, okay, I'm gonna eat this and this, and this is ripe, and then you pick it yourself. And yes. it has also, for sure, I guess, a total different taste than what you have. Fresh, Definitely. Yes. Fresh yeah. taste. Yeah. I feel like that's a new that's a new trend that I've been hearing about where it's uh, restaurants that are actually uh, cooking just seasonal food. Mm. And yeah. I can that's that's something that's new coming up that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. But I have a question in terms of the of the land here in Sweden. How is is the land for example someone wants to just go and farm something do, do can they buy the property or is it all owned by the municipality? So the allotments are mostly owned by the municipality and you rent them. Okay. So you pay a small, it's, it's usually quite cheap. So it's, I would say it's more or less, the fee that you pay is more or less symbolic. So it's okay. a couple of hundred a year or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. But there are also, it's, it's, it's a bit mixed. I mean, in the early days, it used to be also a lot of private land. Mm -hmm. Now that's more uncommon, but there are still some of these development area that are, are private, privately okay. owned. All right. Yeah. That, oh, that so sounds very appealing. Um, uh, I want to start doing my own farming now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> um, it's great fun. <laughs> yeah, so um, you did mention also that uh, you're part of a uh, board, you're a board member of a social enterprise. Yes. Uh, Yella Trappan or something. Yes. Um, what is it about? Can you say a bit more about Yella Trappan then? Yes, Yella Trappan started as, um, as a project. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons why I became interested because a lot of initiatives uh, similar to Yala Trappan, are addressing social issues in different ways. Um, usually, I mean, initiatives from civil society, working together with women, you get project funding and so forth, trying to work with people that have um, difficulty to stay in the labor market or have a difficult to access the labor market. But often what happens is that when the project funding is over, the initiative is over. So it's difficult mm. to keep up activities after the project funding uh, has gone. But Yala Trappen managed to do that. Uh, so it started as projects. Um, but the day after the project ended, the social enterprise started. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, I think, seven or eight years. I've been on the board um, most of the time. I had to leave the board because I was doing an evaluation for the Swedish government on the support for social enterprises and I couldn't then of course be on the board of a social enterprise mm -hmm. at the same time but um, otherwise I've been on the board most of the time and it's it's an inspiring work uh, social enterprise is amazing I think mm -hmm. um, it basically has three legs so to speak um, one is uh, cooking so there's a cafe catering mm -hmm. service one is a tailoring studio um, which is done in collaboration with IKEA and H&M. Okay. And one is a cleaning um, and conference service. And these three legs are about the same in size, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, 40 women, 43 women employed. It's a women's cooperative. So I'm on the board, but the women who are members and who work, they make the important strategic decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's profitable. Um, so it's an amazing example on how you can drive social change, how you can do it yeah. in practice. Okay, wow. and for our listeners, what, how do you define social enterprise? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah for the benefit of <laughs> um, I There is a number of definitions out there. Um, 
I would say to make it easy, but still have the most important points. A social enterprise is an enterprise where the social, the creation of social value is um, the meaning, the, the, the goal of uh, the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And the financial turnover, um, the income, the profit is the means. Mm. It's okay. how you create your social change. But a social enterprise is an enterprise. So it's, it's active largely in, in the market, selling goods and services mm -hmm. uh, to different customers. So I'm guessing a lot of that, um, that money or the economic sustainability then goes back into the enterprise to be able to keep maintaining it? Yes, I mean, it's also quite common that, uh, and sometimes from, for some definitions you're not allowed to um, give the profits out of, of the business, but the profits should be reinvested. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you use the, the, the profits to grow um, the impact, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important um, thing happening now in society that a, lo a lot of social enterprises come up for. I mean, not as much as we would basically need, but at least uh, we're having this shift towards that there is something more important than just making profit, that there is something you can like, uh, yeah, work towards to that enables people to change the society. And basically, uh, I think all businesses should be social businesses yep. I really from I can't really understand why we should have enterprises that are not social enterprises mm -hmm. why do we do things in society that don't benefit people why shouldn't the benefit of all economic activity be to produce social value yeah, that's a well, good that's question. A very, very yeah. interesting point uh. you make there and uh, I guess now like Natalie mentioned uh, with the multitude of challenges that we're having in this in this world at the moment, people are starting to think that maybe the way we did things is not conducive anymore. Like we have to start taking measures to rectify mm -hmm. the wrongs uh, of the past. And that, I guess, very soon, hopefully, a lot more social enterprises will be pop popping up. Uh, but there is still that economic part that is... Well, I think also <laughs> we... What, yeah. um, it's going to take a very long time if we should hope that there will pop up a lot of social enterprises that will yeah. transform the economy in general. But um, I think it's quite possible to see that also um, conventional, if you will, enterprises can be turned into social enterprises. Mm. Mm. Um, I think that's fairly possible. And um, actually, if you see, I mean, on the board of, of Yala Trap, and we also have uh, some people that have been a background in, in commercial for-profit businesses mm. um, and they see the same kind of drive and what's driving people gen in general when they are running a business or an enterprise it's actually not often that they want to make a lot of financial profit mm -hmm. they want to realize a dream yeah uh, they want to realize a vision and that's more important the, the profit for for most entrepreneurs is actually more about getting means to do that kind of transformation yeah so I don't think that there's necessarily a kind of a contradiction here. It's mm. more that the um, the um, the kind of drivers that we have in society, the rules and regulations, are actually tuned in for financial profit. Yeah, yeah. And I that's think the problem. When I think of like companies like, for example, Apple or Facebook themselves, like the whenever whenever you look at the story of Steve Jobs, what he really wanted to create was the bicycle for humans that essentially was able to boost our creative capacities to create a social value to be able to help us. Mm -hmm. But then what happens is that, like you said, the kind of the values in this, the system, how it's being built up, it's kind of changed that we as a society create a completely distorted image of this person that then kind of identify themselves to that. Yes, and I would think also there is definitely some kind of similarities with the transformation of the food system that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. that was kind of crucial for my own journey. Mm -hmm. The fact that we turned from something where you'd have a close relationship to the different ingredients and the ecosystems mm -hmm. that we are part of, um, over to a system where everything become anonymous. Yeah. You yeah. would buy the, the products, the food in the boxes using some kind of, of data sheet. You have indicators, you have the budget saying that you are allowed to buy this amount of that amount and so forth. In a similar way, when you look at, into a modern modern corporation, 
uh, a lot of the decisions made are not made for the benefit of, of people it's made for the benefit of shareholders yeah yeah and the shareholders are not individual um, greedy people it's these large pension funds or investment hedge funds or whatever and they are investing or divesting depending on certain indicators that are totally disconnected from any kind of, of understanding of what these business are actually doing yeah 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 but I think there's also so it's kind of a business alienation yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an algorithm that is essentially was yeah. built with the stock market and everything and it's so complex that we can't understand it and we've built it maybe not so consciously and now we're just kind of being driven by it instead of like you know actually being able to serve the needs that we wanted it to yeah. so but wow. also um, <laughs> but also um, when you talk about this challenge this this concept now that is called impact investing where you know organizations or corporations like they want to re realize the dream of like, making change so they give money to organizations that they think are going to make impact and value and benefits for society like what do, what are your thoughts on that do you think it like <laughs> is it uh, e efficient is it sustainable in the long run or um, oh, that's a, that's a big question <laughs> <laughs> um, of course it's better that we have investment in something that benefits society benefits people benefits the creation of social and ecological values of course that is good yeah. um, why isn't all investment impact investment yeah. what what else oh, is there well that's investment that's only being made for sort of financial purposes or, or the decisions are only made on certain algorithms and so forth you don't know what you're doing it does however we know that from the the, the numbers it looks right mm. Mm. Um, okay. so everything should be impact investment okay but on the other hand what, what do we have today uh, the fact that we it's it's growing it's also showing that there's some kind of consciousness yeah. around this um, let's say that this hopefully can be a first step there's another problem however and that's some of these provider of investments um, how did they make their money um, did they make their money in a fair way uh, mm -hmm. or did they make their money out of depriving people of their human rights or um, mm -hmm. exploiting ecosystems in different ways um, and so forth yeah. Yeah. And I think so if on, on, if you on the one hand you exploit and destroy for humans and for ecosystems and you make a profit and you turn that into impact investment it doesn't make sense mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. and I think uh, now that the awareness is rising so the people actually pressuring the companies on being more having a social impact or having an environmental impact and people go away from the companies that actually make their profit out of uh, exploitation if mm. it's uh, yeah, environmental or social exploitation so I think we have a shift there and what is important for me is that the shift goes from from the bottom up so from the individuals to the companies but the same way the companies really reacting on it and not just greenwashing but really trying to um, yeah shift their values and go towards something sustainable yeah yeah yes i i agree and i think that's going to take a very long time but we do have to kind of wrap it up a little bit yeah so i just have some final questions for, for you frederick uh what advice would you give to people that are maybe starting their sustainability journey or that are that care for the world and don't know how to do something do something. <laughs> <laughs> Do something nice um, and simple. They, I, I mean, there are a couple of things uh, to say about that. One thing is that it's sometimes sort of portrayed that um, the sustainable world is a world where we have to give up the things that mean something for us, that it's going to be going back to the caves, more or less. And um, Actually, um, what is valued in a, in a sustainable or a society that is more sustainable are things that actually value have the biggest value for us social relations and so forth mm. um, what we need to do is do less we need to work less we need to worry less we need to use less energy um, what we need to do more we need to do spend more time with our families we need to spend more time in nature mm -hmm. we need to spend more time off social media <laughs> <laughs> um, and instead reading books reflecting talking to other people 
So is this a transformation that's going to be sort of tough for us? Maybe, but that's because we've been trained to consume and to and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have, um, if you listen to yourself, if you reflect, you take a deep breath, um, close your eyes and think about how you would like things to be in your in your context and try to do that and try to take the more small steps um, do the things that make sense to you that is fun that you can do mm -hmm. um, talk to people that you haven't talked to be nice the mm -hmm. most important thing in order to have a more sustainable society I think is to be nice yeah to not only to your friends um, and to your dog <laughs> but also to to random strangers yes. yeah. say hello to people in the streets mm. okay. um, help somebody hold the door for an elderly lady give up your seat on the train yeah. um, that's a first step towards sustainability okay so that inner sustainability awesome. just as we discuss here and this is what <laughs> sustain me is all about yeah. Yeah. so thank you so much for joining us i think this was an amazing conversation to have with you and mm -hmm. yeah don't Thank forget you. to grow your own food <laughs> <No>. <laughs> grow your own, your own soul as well you know yes. <laughs> yeah. okay it's actually very well connected growing your food and growing your soul oh, yeah. oh perfect and nice. we'll we'll end it up there i think you heard it here on sustain yeah. me <laughs> growing your food it was growing your soul <laughs> <laughs> all right so yep. thank you so thank, thank you. you for listening and we're gonna be back after a short break So welcome back, people. Uh, we are now back with only the host. The guest has left the room. So now we can <laughs> just give our thoughts on the conversation and how it went. So how do we... Uh, how about Chima? What do you think? Well, I, I'll say I learned quite a bit. Um, mm. Yeah, like Very valuable um, information, practical information also. Uh, and also learned a little bit about uh, Frederick's life, which is yeah. always intriguing. I always love to listen to people's stories and what drives them and how they got to a certain point. So that was very um, insightful. And yeah, I mean, the steps that he shared, um, I, I think it's something that I try to implement in my daily life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just good to hear it, reaffirm it from someone else who has more knowledge on this on this field. So that's, that's yeah, good. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, what do, you, what do you think? What do you guys think? Yeah, um, yeah for me, the, the, the food part was mm -hmm. really nice because I really love food and uh, it really does have an impact on us, the disconnection and then connecting back through food to mm. our environment, to the nature, to the animals, to everything. And that was something really important for me. And then the uh, basically the wrap up that we had, like what what uh, he suggested us to do is just do it. Don't say, OK, I don't have an impact or how what can I do? I'm just small. No, just start doing things mm -hmm. and then stuff will change around you and you will feel it. And that for me yeah. was really... Like Shia LaBeouf, just do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think um, for me, the interesting part is how, like when, you know, you, we see them as a teacher, but we don't really know his story. Yeah. But the interesting is how every single guest that we have, whenever we ask them at the end how they came up to this, is this kind of like sub quest of realization and why are we doing these things? How are we doing them wrong? Or how are we doing them, you know, in an unsustainable way? And it was like out of his passion, which was food, that I would have never thought before. Yeah. And yeah. it's just very interesting. And I think it was very spiritual in a sense, how he communicated the message mm -hmm. of yeah. our connection and how we embody the food and this type of relationship, which I, I didn't expect from him to, yeah. you know, because our conversations in, in class are very much like just, you know, teacher, teacher student type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that was very, very interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's always fascinating, like really hearing the story behind the person. How did they get to that point? And that like sometimes we have a we have a picture in our head because, yeah, in this case, OK, our teacher, we have a picture. And then with all the background information, you it's you can understand people so much better. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also, I think that's really important also for the environment if we get to if we make the the um how do you say the if we invest time in get to know people that's yes. gonna open up so many more 
uh, channels, channels of yeah. connection. And it will get rid of so many communication problems. Of course, <laughs> of course. And I guess that's what we're trying to do. It's sustain yep. me through inspiring stories and hearing people's stories and how they got to a certain point and learning from them. So, And I hope uh, you as a, as a guest, uh, uh, will, the listener, will definitely join us in this journey. And um, hopefully we get to hear more from you um if you want to follow us once again at, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at any of the channels uh, instagram facebook uh, yep. sustain me and you can listen to us on spotify itunes and every other channel you can think of and hope to see you soon yep and if you actually want to uh, ask us any personal questions you can always email us uh, email us at sustainme.ask at gmail.com so with that being said thank you for listening and see you next time yep. see you next time bye we are creating the world we're now living in We are competing in We are repeating in We are believing in It's time for us to shift our mind From best in the world to best For the world Make decisions intentional To take decisions intentional Making decisions intentional Make decisions intentional To take decisions intentional Making decisions intentional It creates a new world to mind a shift Intentionality Perceptuality Conceptuality, we are choosing to shift our mind to best for the world, best for our world. Make decisions intentional, to take decisions intentional, making decisions intentional. Make decisions intentional, to take decisions intentional, making decisions intentional.